I can't tell you how great it feels to be standing on the stage. As, as I was walking into this building today, I, I realized that after the home I grew up in, this is the building where I've spent more time than any other place on earth. Uh, I, I walked in, I, I saw Dan Frank, the terrific principal here, and, and Parker alum as well, and got to spend a few minutes with, with him. And uh, I can't tell you how fortunate I was to be here for 14 years, and how fortunate I feel tonight to be out of New York City, <laughs> w where apparently locusts will be arriving any moment now, uh, uh, and, and back home in Chicago. Now, the, the second thing I realized when I was standing uh, in the wings backstage is that the last time I got to spend an hour right here was during the eighth grade production of Oliver Twist. And I thought that instead of discussing going solo tonight, I might sing for you. Uh, and, and then I remembered that this is on videotape. The other thing I have to say is um, I've always had this fantasy of being the opening act for a rock star. Um, and it's really nice to have the stage before Nate Silver gets here. Uh, I might just do a stand-up routine tonight, actually. <laughs> Instead, uh, let me talk about um, going solo. And let me start by asking you to turn your attention to the image on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm a crude salesman, so you know, I want you to remember the image for the next time you're in Barnes & Noble or the <laughs> room here afterwards. But there, there's another motivation for me to have this image up there. Um, I want you to, to pay attention to two things. The first is the title of the book, Going Solo, because I want to tell you that it was a hard-won title. Um, I worked on this project that became the book for many years, uh, and the working title for the book was Alone in America. <laughs> um, so you get you know, the jump from, from Alone in America to Going Solo. Um, and the second thing I want you to, to pay attention to are the birds. Because it turns out that um, if you have a book called Alone in America, you can think of the, the cover image that would go on that. I'm going to show it to you in a second. Um, but going solo is actually a really tricky concept to get an image for. We don't have an image for it. If you could do the next slide. I want to persuade you in the next 40 minutes of two things. The, the first is this claim here, right, that, 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 that the rise of living alone represents one of the great social changes of our time, and we haven't named it or identified it. The next slide. And this is the second. Can you see that OK? <laughs> when I'm at Parker, I always presume that the people are literate, uh, and I don't have to read all the slides, so I won't read all the slides for, for you. It doesn't mean what we think, OK? And, I, and I'll get into that. So, Alone in America, what are you going to put on the cover? Next slide. <laughs> you have two choices. First possibility, right, the kind of Lone Ranger figure. This is a great icon in American culture. Um, uh, and in fact, a completely appropriate image for a book called Alone in America up until about, until about 1950. Because uh, at that time, Living alone was pretty unusual, and it was most common in the big, sprawling western states, places like Alaska and Wyoming and Montana. Um, the people who lived alone were typically migrant men. And when I close my eyes and think about who lived alone, I like to think about a guy who looked like that. Right? <laughs> this is a sophisticated, urban Chicago crowd. So when you think of who should go on the cover of a book called Alone in America, you surely think about the next slide. <laughs> right? Edward Hopper, Nighthawk, could all walk down the street at the end of the talk tonight and check it out if they'd open the museum doors for us. Right? This is the great image of what it means to be alone in America. A and it's a powerful image. There's a reason it has this iconic status. And there are a few things I want to call your attention to, one of which is the fact that the guy in the scene the one we kind of worry about and fear for, we actually don't see his face. He could be having the time of his life. <laughs> 
But we project onto him this sense that you know, he is a solitary, lonely, alienated figure. If you look more closely to the back of the scene, you'll notice that there's a couple there. Probably not a love connection. <laughs> it, 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 it's not so clear that they're any less lonely than the guy in the front. And I want you to think about that over the course of our conversation tonight. Next slide, please. It makes sense in 1943 or 1950 to have images of people who are alone that seem strange and unusual because, in fact, being single at that time in American history was exceedingly strange and unusual. In 1950, 22% of American adults were single or unmarried, and 9% of U.S. households had just one person. Right, these are pretty low numbers, and so if you go to the next slide, you'll understand why when <laughs> psychologists at the University of Michigan did a survey of Americans' attitudes towards people who were single and wanted to be, they found that 80% of Americans thought if you are single and you're okay with that, you know, you're one of these three things, sick, neurotic, or my favorite, immoral. <laughs> the next slide, please. Let me also say that my home discipline of sociology has contributed to this sentiment. The, the best-selling books in the history of my discipline have titles like The Lonely Crowd, The Fall of Public Man, Bowling Alone. You remember that one? <laughs> I know Sherry Turkle has spoken here before. Her great new book is Alone Together. So I was incentivized to write a book called Alone in America, right? That's the easy path towards bestsellerdom. We, we like to come together as a community and talk about how alone we are, right? <laughs> Next slide, please. It, it, in fact, you know, one of the big blockbuster studies from, from my field that came out a few years ago uh, reported this staggering finding. I'm going to summarize it for you because I'm guessing that some of you had your subscription to the American Sociological Review lapse. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but, but the finding was that in 1985, uh, fewer than one in 10 Americans reported that they had no confidant, no, no close friend, whereas in 2004, one in four Americans said they had no confidant. This is, a stagger this is like the most depressing news you could ever get. Um, and like I told you, we love to hear the story. And, and so the, the image there, the bar chart that shows this, comes from the USA Today. I want you to remember this, right? Because if you publish a paper that shows that Americans have no friends, you will then be in every media outlet in the country. Um, you will never be less lonely. Um, next slide, please. The conversation has a digital cultural component to it. If you read the Atlantic Monthly, perhaps you noticed this cover story from a few months ago. Um, is Facebook making us more lonely? The answer, according to the author of this paper, this article, yes, we have never been as lonely as we are today. We have never been more atomized. Um, this is a, a, a very sad tale of woe indeed. Next slide. Hardly innocent. Uh, le let me say that my first book uh, about the heat wave in Chicago, which is about climate change and urban inequality and, and poverty and vulnerability and, and racial uh, disparities in health, I think hit a nerve because the thing that made the heat wave here so tragic and terrible is that hundreds of people died alone. And, and when I talk about the book, I talk about the reality of isolation in American life. That, you know, there are more people than ever before old and alone in this country, and many of them are isolated, and we need to worry about them, and that was the subject of this book. So, so I have contributed to this conversation that stirs up anxiety about the problem of isolation, and in fact, it was doing work on this book that motivated the research that became Going Solo. What I'm about to tell you is the story of how I learned how much I had to learn about this topic once I dug into it. Because I thought I was going to write a book that was the continuation of Heat Wave, that elaborated the story of the people who died alone in Chicago. But I learned something else, indeed. Next slide. <laughs> 
the first thing I did when, when I, I, I finished this book about Chicago was to think about one line that uh, a, a worker at the city's and county's uh, office of the public administrator told me. This is an office where they work with cases when someone dies and no one comes to claim the body or the estate. And a man said to me, you know, we work inside of a secret society of people who live and die alone. And I thought, wow, you know what? this is a powerful idea that there's this secret society out there. Who, who's part of this secret society of, of people who are living alone? I wanted to know. And I, and I really thought I was going to find a world full of mostly older people who are very isolated. But the first thing I did, if you look at the bar chart at the bottom, try to ignore the thing on the top because I'll get back to it, is I, I asked, in the United States, who lives alone? What's the age structure here? And I learned something that was actually pretty surprising to me. There are about 33 million Americans living alone today. And of them, about 11 million, or a third, are over the age of 65. Now, I hesitate to call them elderly, as many people do, because part of the story here is that people who are aging and aging alone are actually younger and more active and healthier than ever before. Uh, and in fact, that's part of the reason they're aging alone, that they can. But, but that actually was not the thing that captivated my attention most. What really fascinated me is the fact that two-thirds of people who are living alone in the United States are considerably younger. The majority are middle-aged adults between 35 and 64. I'd like to say that middle age starts at 45, because it would be convenient for me. Um, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, and then... In recent decades, the fastest growing segment of people who live alone are young adults under the age of 35. 1% of young adults lived alone in 1950 compared to about 11% today. Next slide, please. The social change is extraordinary. If you think about the numbers of how we live and who we are. And this has been a week where we talked a lot about demographics, right? If you, if you can stay in your seat and not let them kick you out before the guy after me comes on, um, you'll hear a lot about demographics and the new demographics. This is the new demographic that for me is the most fascinating. You don't see social changes like this very often. 22% of Americans were single in 1950. 49% of American adults are single today, higher than ever. 9% of one-person households in 1950. 28% of all households have just one person today. We don't see numbers like this. Next slide. I'll, I'll just show you a couple slides quickly. This is what the population numbers look like. The next slide. If you are thinking about this in terms of proportion of households, that's what it looks like. Next slide. And here's the thing that's really interesting for us in Chicago tonight. You'll remember that in 1950, this was this rural, western phenomenon. Now it is an urban condition. I live in Manhattan now, where just a little under one in two of every household is a one-person household, 46%. Washington, D.C., it's now 48%. Maybe you're not surprised by that. We're a little strange in Manhattan. But check out Atlanta and Cleveland and Minneapolis and Denver and Seattle. Look at all those cities above 40%. And look at the fact that in most of the big cities, it's about one in three households are one person households. This is an incredible thing. And it's an urban thing. Next slide, please. So what I did is decide to organize a research project that got beyond the numbers. I got a group of doctoral students from NYU and some from Berkeley and other institutions as well. And we started to go out into the city and hunt for singles. I should tell you at this point, I should tell you at this point, I'm a married guy. I, I saw my three-year-old daughter walk in and then walk out like a couple se you know, seconds after she walked in. Um, I'm not here tonight to persuade you to do anything different. <laughs> Honey, you really should have come with me to this talk today. Uh, I learned some amazing things about living alone. Uh, <laughs> I've got some news for you. 
that's not what I'm here to do. I am not making the case for or against or anything. We're here to understand. Um, and this is how we understand, by trying to understand how, how people live. Next slide. One of the real breakthroughs for me came when I realized that the framing of conversations around being alone in America is a framing that's about problems. It's the story of decline. You know, this idea like once upon a time there was a golden age. That, that time, by the way, was the 1950s. Um, <laughs> families were stronger, marriages worked better, children were happier, they played in the streets, things kind of worked better then. Um, and since then, decline. Social problem. And maybe there's a grain of truth in that story. I personally think Mad Men gives you better sociology than Father Knows Best. <laughs> There's, there's some pretty lo lonely people in Mad Men uh, who, who, who are quite married, as far as I can tell. Um, but I realized that I, I would understand this phenomenon more if I thought of it as a social experiment rather than as a social problem. And for me, that framing changed everything. Next slide. And why social experiment? Well, it turns out, if you look at the record of how we have lived as a species, that until the 1950s, you literally cannot find a single society in human history that sustained large numbers of people living alone for long periods of time. You simply cannot find one. This is a new way to live, right? Which means we have about 200,000 years of history collectively living in groups and about 60 years of experience living alone. There's a lot to understand. Next slide. I started to ask these questions. You know, what is this all about? What made this happen? And what are we to make of it all? Next slide. Well, the first thing to say here is that living alone is expensive. You don't live alone if you live in a poor neighborhood. You don't live alone if you live in a poor nation. It just doesn't happen, which tells you that living alone is made possible by economic affluence and security, and that has come from the marketplace, and it has also come, crucially, from the welfare state. These have been fundamental to providing uh, the kinds of human security that make it possible for an individual to live outside of the domestic family unit that has anchored human life for all of history. So these things are fundamental to our story. But if we recognize that, then we have to think about this next question on the next slide. Not what's wrong with us, but of all the ways we could use our resources, right? <laughs> of all the ways we could use our wealth, why this, right? That's a tough question, it turns out. I mean, it's a really interesting question, a much more interesting one, as far as I'm concerned, than what's wrong with us. Next slide. So when you step back and think about it and listen to people talk about why they live alone, you, you hear that living alone is attractive because it comports with many of our most sacred modern values. It gives people the freedom to do what they want to do, to live the way that they like. It gives people the capacity to gain some level of control over themselves and, and their lives. It gives people a chance to become the kind of person they want to be. It's especially true for young people, by the way. Um, you're much, much more likely to marry successfully if you marry as a, a slightly older person who's spent some time discovering who you are and what you want in a, a life and a partner than you are if you race into marriage as a very young people. The marriage rates, the difference is shocking. No surprise that living alone gives you access to solitude, which is a hard-won thing in an age where we're constantly connected by iPhone and iPad and things like that. And, and so paradoxically, living alone can give us a, an opportunity to make better and deeper connections. And many of the people who I spoke to who live alone said precisely that. Next slide. When I put this slide up in front of my undergraduates, there's total silence in the room. 
you, you cannot understand the rise of living alone outside of the rising status of women. Uh, when women gain entry to the paid labor market in mass, when women gain control over their own bodies and lives, uh, when women become more economically and culturally independent, this changes everything about the way that we organize our lives and make families. The marriage rate goes up. It's now higher than it's ever been. It's over 30 for the typical age of first marriage in many American big cities now. Um, divorce rates go up. Our sexual norms change. This is a fundamental thing. You cannot understand the rise of living alone outside of the rising status of women. And if you want proof of that, you know, consider places like Saudi Arabia, where there's incredible affluence and no one lives alone. Next slide. You also can't understand the rise of living alone outside of the communications revolution. Because if you can be home with a television or a telephone, that means you're connected to a world of ideas and entertainment in a way that historically was not possible. Now throw into the mix the internet, and with it Skype, and Facebook, and email, and instant messaging, and all the information and entertainment we get from that, to be home alone typically means to be connected to the world through some other medium. And I know that if Sherry Turkle were here, she would be saying, look, the problem in life is that you know, we're so connected to our devices, we're so immersed in this technology that we forget each other. Right? Like we go to bed at night and our spouse is lying next to us and we're cuddling up to the iPad. <laughs> and there is a grain of truth in that for sure. And, you know, I can't stand it when I'm driving in a taxi, uh, riding in a taxi in Manhattan and my taxi driver's barreling down Fifth Avenue, you know, texting. Um, <laughs> so I get the problem. Um, but let me tell you that the best research we have so far tells us that the heaviest users of social media and cell phones are also the heaviest users of FaceTime. I, I don't mean the Apple program, FaceTime. I mean like <laughs> actual interaction, face-to-face -face interaction. So we use social media to draw us into the social world, and, and singles do this in particular. We have to make a distinction between living alone and being alone. We too often fail to do that. And let me tell you something surprising. There are a lot of surprises for me in the course of, of working on this book. I discovered that people who live alone, on average, are actually more likely to spend time with friends and with neighbors than people who are married. Here's a shocker for you. Um, they're more likely to go out at night and spend time in bars and cafes and restaurants than, than married people. Uh, who knew, right? Who knew? Uh, more, genuine surprise, more likely to volunteer in civic organizations than people who are married, which is a real blow to the selfish singles, you know, stigma that remains part of our culture. You know, who that's especially true for, um, by the way, is women. Women are far more likely to participate in civil organizations, civic organizations as volunteers if they're single and living alone versus if they're married. Because here's a total surprise to me, which I'm still kind of having some trouble working out, um, that they say women do more domestic labor than men, <laughs> and that, they, that, that this work makes it more difficult for them to engage in the public sphere, right? Uh, still shocking to me. Um, uh, so clearly, um, this is not the story that, that I expected. And, and, and the truth is really that social media and communications are playing a role in this. Next slide. I showed you the, um, the map of the United States where people live alone. Y you also can't understand the rise of, of going solo outside of urbanization. Because if I tell you that 35% of households in Chicago are one-person households, you as Chicagoans know that they are not evenly distributed throughout every one of Chicago's neighborhoods. You, 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 you already are thinking about the particular places where 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the households are one-person households, right? They're the places where it's fun to go out. 
people move to urban neighborhoods to live alone, but also be together. They, they go to buildings uh, or to neighborhoods that allow them to have domestic autonomy, but also to make connections when they want them. And if you think about the composition of our cities, singles and people who live alone play a pretty powerful role and are pr pretty prominent. In fact, I, I made that comment about the fun neighborhoods purposely. Um, we all benefit in some way from the public life that gets animated by single people. In my view, you can't understand the revitalization of city centers in the last 30 or 40 years outside of the rise of people who live alone because they are more likely to be out there and they're spending money. They have more discretionary income on average than pe people who are married. Um, and they are here in the streets, on the sidewalks, in restaurants, creating a, a different kind of culture. Next slide. You also can't understand the rise of going solo outside of the longevity revolution. People now live longer than ever before in the history of our species. Um, and it is not uncommon these days for someone to outlive their spouse by two or five or 10 or 20 or 30 years, which, which means that, and it's typically a woman, it, it, it means that we now have a stage of life that didn't exist before, a, a significant period of time in which people have to make their lives. And I, let me tell you, um, there are things to be concerned about here, but when I did interviews with older people who live alone, and we did more than 150, I learned a lot of really interesting things. For instance, um, old, older people who live alone have struggles with loneliness and all kinds of, of difficulties. If they have outlived their spouse, they clearly wish that their spouse was still with them. But they will tell you that they would strongly prefer to have a place of their own than to move in with their children or with a sibling or with friends or, God forbid, a nursing home, right? And in fact, if you told them, look, you can't do this anymore, you need to move in with some other people, they would experience that as a loss of dignity and integrity, as a loss of face. They don't want it for the most part. Now, they also don't want to be isolated and alone, so it's not like we've solved this problem. But if you think about it, they're paying a premium to age alone. And it's not a, 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 an easy social change to deal with, uh, but we have to deal with it honestly. There's another thing I learned about this that has a specific gender component to it, and that is that women are far more likely to age alone than men, and they're also, I'll put it bluntly, much better at it. Women tend to do a much better job staying connected to friends and family, do a better job making new relationships than men do. And you know there's this kind of myth out there that if you go into a geriatric community or an assisted living facility, you know, you'll find dozens of women hunting around for the last standing single men, <laughs> trying to get him to the altar before it's too late. This is not what they told us, at least in interviews. It, what they said was actually pretty interesting. They said, look, we'd rather have someone to go out with than someone to come home to. Yeah. Right, they, they don't want to be alone, but they also have had typically the experience of caring for someone who was sick, who was having trouble, who was maybe dying. And thank you very much, they don't need to have that again. It's not even clear that that's healthy for them. So there's a debate about, is it healthier to be married or single? It's tough at this stage of life. Next slide. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat this story. Uh, I remain as concerned about frail aging seniors getting isolated and abandoned as I was when I wrote Heat Wave. During tough 
times like the recession that we've been going through, cities cut back on their social programs, we enter into an age of austerity, and the programs that get cut are programs that include Meals on Wheels and home care for the elderly and senior center hours and all those things, and those programs do God's work, and we cut them at our collective shame. We, we, this, this is a big issue. We hear about older people who live alone during heat waves or hurricanes or disasters. Most of the time, they're invisible. I think that this is a major issue for public policy that we have yet to address. The boomers, as you know, are getting old. The oldest boomers are now 66. As many old people are, as we have living alone today, there will be more and more and more in coming years. And we don't have an idea about how we're going to provide good housing for them. Right? If you're affluent, you can move into an assisted living facility where you get good care, but you hemorrhage money when you're there. And even quite wealthy families find that there's a lot less left, if anything, after 5 or 10 or 20 years in a place like that. We have to find a way of democratizing access to places where older people can age alone with dignity and stay connected to people around them. And we have failed to do this thus far. Next slide. What about loneliness? You know, isn't it lonely to be alone? It can be. No doubt, it can be. But let me tell you, um, loneliness is part of the human condition. And it can even be a productive physiological emotion, physiological condition, insofar as it cues us to the fact that we need companionship. A little loneliness can tell us it's time to get off the couch and into the social world, right? Let me tell you one of the most powerful and memorable things that the people who had once been married but were now living alone told me in the course of my interviews is this. As lonely as it might be to be home alone, right? There's a chance to go out and make another connection. If you're lying in bed at night next to your spouse or sitting at the dinner table and over and over again you feel lonely, that's a profound experience and feeling. And it's not quite clear what you do about it. So we shouldn't make the mistake of believing that loneliness is for those who live alone only. Right? In fact, it's, it's far more common than that. And we know for a fact that people who live alone and are socially engaged and active do not have the highest levels of loneliness around. Uh, and that many people who are unhappily married experience more loneliness. It's more complicated than that. Right? Some of the things we believe about the social world turn out not to be true. Next slide. For instance, Remember that study I told you about in the American Sociological Review, the one that told us that one in four Americans have no confidant, no close friend? Guess what? It turns out to be wrong. By which I mean the evidence is wrong, the data were wrong. There was a problem with the survey. And people who are in the field who know this research and have seen the decades of research we have on it said, that cannot be true when the thing came out. It is just impossible that we went from 10% to one in four of Americans having no confidence. There's got to be a problem here. And it turns out, on closer inspection, there were serious flaws with the data. It is unreliable. As one of the authors of the paper, the one who's he's now a Cornell professor, at the time he was the graduate student who like, was actually doing the numbers, now acknowledges. Quick quiz for you. Guess which research finding was not featured on the USA Today and every major media outlet <laughs> in the United States? You can see the headline now. Americans, just about as social as we've always been. <laughs> it doesn't play, and we don't hear about it. Next slide, please. I've told you a lot tonight about how wrong I was about the alone part of my great book title, Alone in America. 
So it turns out what I really screwed up was the in America part. I thought this was a story about American individualism, right? I thought this was Emerson and Thoreau and self-reliance and the Lone Ranger. But it turns out that we in the United States are laggards, <laughs> not leaders, when it comes to living alone. Living alone is more common in Canada and family-centric Japan than it is in the United States. It is more common in most of the societies in Europe with which we normally compare ourselves, and it is by far the most common in the Scandinavian countries. In Sweden, at the national level, they have the same rates of living alone that we have in Manhattan. In Stockholm, which is the world's capital of living alone, 60% of all households have just one person. Right? Why is it that the Scandinavian countries have such high levels of living alone? Why is it that living alone, which used to be this rural phenomenon, is now something that we see in cities, even in the United States? I asked myself this several times and finally came to the conclusion that when you invest in the common good, when you invest in each other, when you invest in subsidized housing and health care and home care and public transportation, you make the streets safe, you create the conditions in which it's possible for people to come together, but also to have security when they're on their own. You allow people to live in the way that works best for them at that time. Now, people generally don't aspire to live alone. And very few people will live alone or be single their entire lives. We tend to move out in and out of different conditions. We're alone, we're together, we're together, we're alone. But what I realized by the end of the project is that our lives are different today than they've been in the past. There is no one right way to live. There's no best way to live that we can really identify for any particular person at any particular moment. And the societies that sustain large numbers of people living alone are places that invest in each other, which means there's a kind of surprising story at the end of this inquiry that's very different from the story we get in Bowling Alone or The Lonely Crowd. And that story is fundamentally that it's our interdependence that makes our independence possible. It's, it's our interdependence that, that makes our independence possible. It means that I don't see the rise of living alone as a sign of our disconnection so much as I do it see it as a sign of what happens when we invest in and take care of each other. And let me tell you, that's a very different idea than the one that was the impetus for alone in America. Go to the next slide. I hope at this point you understand the concept of going solo. I hope you see that the reason we had to go for the birds is because Edward Hopper, bless him, just wouldn't work. What's going to work next? You know, how will we live? How will we take care of each other? How will we stay connected? How will we deal with the incredible stress and uncertainty that comes from living in a world where there is no right path? There are many. You know, those are questions that I certainly didn't answer in my book, and that probably none of us can answer on our own. For that, we need to talk together. Thank you very much. So, so, so I've been asked to tell you that we, ha we have time for some conversation. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, because the event's being recorded, uh, please come up to the mics at the front, and I believe there are mics in the higher level as well.
Thank you for coming there because I was about to start singing. You wanted to sing. <laughs> that would be fine. Uh, I just had a question, I, a couple questions. One, how did your research kind of, uh, were you able to split that up racially? And how, uh, like, instances of people living alone divided among different races? And then secondly, historically, how have we compared to other countries? Yeah. So um, we did do a breakdown of living alone by, by race and ethnicity. And I will tell you that uh, whites are most likely to live alone, uh, followed by African Americans. Latinos and Asians are lower. However, uh, if you break it down even further, you find that the more time a, a, a family has stayed in the United States, the, the, more, the more generations there are, the more likely it is that you'll find people living alone. So it's kind of part of Americanness. Um, there's one specific group that I should talk about because they really do have a different situation, and that's African American women. Uh, African American women have exceedingly high rates of living alone and being unmarried. And this is due, in my view, to some, some quite tragic circumstances. And there's two of them, specifically. The first is massive incarceration of African American men, which has removed countless potentially viable marriage partners from the marriage market. Uh, and the second is the ongoing racial prejudice and discrimination that gives African American women fewer potential partners uh, because men who are not African American show very little interest in marrying them. Um, and these are brutal facts um, on both counts. But they mean that there are so many successful African-American women who are living alone, uh, that, that they're real distinctive issues. There's a professor at University of Maryland named Chris Marsh who's writing a lot about this issue, um, and I hope it gets more attention. It's one of the reasons that people are living alone in the Western world, it's, in the advanced Western world, is because it's a reaction to, say, uh, millennia of authoritarian households and families. I, I can't rule that out. Um, I don't know that those are that those kinds of authorita I mean, authoritarian. I mean, house not in recent history, but say further back, people will, will think to remember well, uh, adult or single sure. adults basically have as much freedom as say ten-year-old children. The thing is that the West hardly has a monopoly on authoritarian households historically, um, and so comparatively speaking, you know, we don't get much bang for the buck focusing on that. I mean, w what we observe is that people live alone wherever they can. Uh, and, and that's a very striking thing, right? That's why I frame this question in terms of uh, why people in the world's most affluent societies do this. I should say that they're not all Western societies, and I should also tell you that in the last decade or so, the, the fastest growing uh, nations experiencing the rise of living alone are China, India, and Brazil. So, so we really do see that you know, this combination of economic security or affluence uh, and women's independence uh, is, is, is quite powerful. Now, have people had very tough experiences in families that belie the father knows best story? Absolutely, and I think people, due to that, are looking for some better way to live. Hi there. Uh, can you draw any correlations between living alone and life expectancy? Um, the, the problem is that um, people really do move in and out of different experiences, uh, and, and the number of people who live alone for all of their adult life and who would be useful for this comparison is pretty small. Um, so so um, the happiness research is interesting on this score. It actually tells us, not longevity, but the happiness literature tells us that the never marrieds do really well. Uh, they're below people who are currently married, which in my view means successfully married, 
but they're better off than people who are recently divorced or bereaved. Um, and, and I think that's, that's worth some, something. It's pretty interesting information. Now, when it comes down to it, we really need to look at the specific group. And the way my book is organized is it looks at living alone at these different periods of life, like the younger adults who are spending more time living alone as they search for the right partner, right? Because the story I'm telling tonight is not, you know, people are alone and, and never settling down, uh, period. It's that people are not necessarily settling for the wrong person. Right? Because people know that you can be quite lonely in a marriage or relationship, and they've experienced firsthand in many cases the consequences of living through divorce or family that doesn't work. They're, they're, they're reluctant to choose uh, the wrong partner. So for them, it's a very different experience. Now, an interesting question, which I would love to see some research on, is so you're a 60-year-old woman, and your partner dies, your spouse dies, um, or you get divorced. Are you better off? Are you going to live longer if you stay single? Or are you going to live longer if you get married? I mean, so th that for me is the real question. And I just can't imagine. I, I haven't seen the re research. I don't think it's been done. I would be stunned, stunned, stunned to learn that you're better off getting married because the odds are the person who you could marry is likely to get sick before you, is likely to die before you, and you're likely to become his caretaker, which is going to be bad for your health, we know. So it's a really interesting question, but we need more research. Yeah. What kind of correlation, if any, is there in people who are living alone as adults who were only children or part of a bigger family? Yeah. Does that have any influence at all? It, it, I don't know the answer to it. Oh. Um, is it. Is it more likely that you'll live alone if you were an only child because you're secure? So I can't answer it because I didn't do the research, but I'll tell you something that is pretty interesting. Um, one of my favorite parts of doing this book project was studying the history of the home the, as an architectural unit. And I learned that there's another thing that we do now that we never really did before in the history of our species, and that is give children their own private room, right? The, the, it, it used to be, even 30 years ago, that the typical American home had more people than rooms. Now it's more rooms than people. And, and let me tell you, as someone who lives in Manhattan, I know countless people who leave that place because they can't afford to have a, a private room for each child, and they feel as if they are depriving their children of this kind of fundamental right or entitlement, that their children would be better off. They sh they, they need, so even if they love living in Manhattan, maybe less at the end of this week, uh, <laughs> I, I wrote to my friend, you know, I was worried about the locust coming, and he said, you know, you're, you're a firstborn son. It could be worse. Um, so, 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 um, you know, so, so what's happened is that we have created homes, not just in the United States, but all over the world, where people can achieve a level of solitude even when they're together in a group. There are a couple kind of great images for this. You know, one is the, the family dinner where everybody is on their iPhone and they might as well not be sharing the table with each other. But there's a great, great book by a, a sociologist at University of Pennsylvania named Annette LaRoe called Unequal Childhoods. And she really hits this point well where she says, you know, it, it used to be that kids in a, a family would play together after school. And you know, there was like a neighborhood thing that they'd do together, or like if one kid played soccer, they all played soccer, and you would just organize, probably work to the detriment of the younger kids, but the kind of family would do the same stuff. She has this concept for the way that affluent and middle class families raise children right now, which she calls concerted cultivation. And the idea is that we as parents try to individualize the experiences and instruction of each of our children to help them maximize their talents and fulfill their interests. She says that the, 
the, the calendar on the refrigerator has replaced the mantle, uh, you know, as the place where the action happens. And she documents the great lengths to which families will go to make sure that Sally plays the trombone while Miles does field hockey or whatever it is. And, and we're willing to do these kinds of things in a way that's different. So that's a long-winded way of saying um, there are ways in which we've allowed people to achieve a level of independence and autonomy as children without having them as only children. I'm sorry? Unequal Childhoods by Annette Leroux. And David Brooks writes about it every other day. So if you... <laughs> yeah. You had mentioned that people who have high levels of connectedness through social media have higher levels of FaceTime. Yes. It, it, has there been any analysis of the quality of that FaceTime, or is it they're sitting across from each other and texting? Uh, there, there, there hasn't been an analysis of the quality. It's a, it's a tough one, the quality of time. Um, and you know, part of the problem is like, you know, my wife and I will spend a night together and. I'll say, oh, this is such a great night, you know, so great to talk to you. And she'll call her friends and say, God, what a bore. You know, this is <laughs> awful. <right? laughs> um, no, I mean, the, the point I'm making is we have different experiences of it. So I don't know, and I don't know how you could, could do that, but it would be an interesting experiment. I mean, I, I, I trust the, that research. I, I, I believe that, there, that the people who are using social media are really active users of social life. They like being engaged with other people, and they... they they're using the social part of the media to draw them into these kind of interactions. They, they want to be in the world. Let's remember, um, the rise of living alone comes at the same time as the rise of internet dating sites. And my point is that is not a contradiction. Right? I, I'm not here to tell you, you know, we have rejected marriage as the wrong way to live. Um, we want to be single, it's better. I don't believe that, it would be hypocritical, there's no evidence for it, period. But I am saying that we need to really understand the difference between living alone and being alone and feeling lonely. These are different conditions and we conflate them all too often. Thank you. If there's someone up there, yeah, I see your jump, don't jump, don't jump, yeah. yeah. We don't have a microphone. Okay, I'll repeat your question then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't hear the question, so let's go down here. <laughs> so, so let me tell you, you know, the brutal facts. Um, what we know from the literature on sex, the best of which is done at the University of Chicago by Ed Lauman and his team there, um, is that people who are married have sex more often than people who are single on average. The AARP did a study of, of divorcees over the age of 40, and they have a similar finding. I'll tell you another thing I heard from people I talked to during this book. I'll reach for the water for this one. <laughs> it turns out there are some people uh, who tell you they would rather have less sex with more people than more sex with one person. Uh, they're typically men. <laughs> and not my friends. I wanted to ask you if uh, you could hypothesize or looking forward, going solo, what will be the social and economic implications of such a profound change to human societies? Uh, I mean, this is the big question. I mean, what, what are the long-term consequences of this? Um, there are a couple big issues here. Um, I mentioned one of them, which is you know, what are we going to do about aging alone? And how, are we going to find some better way of 
creating an infrastructure of housing that allows people to age alone and stay connected and get the kind of care and support and services they need. The book ends in Sweden where I think they do a better job with that than they do in the United States, but it requires a massive public program and project and it doesn't work during an age of austerity. It works when you make a, a collective decision to invest in a new kind of infrastructure. And I think the housing issue is a big one. But by far the bigger issue, which is you know, the subject of much of my work and the thing that you can't stop thinking about now, is you know, is this environmentally sustainable? You know, is, it, is it ecologically sustainable to have a world where we have individual homes rather than shared homes? And here we just don't have good research, period. At first glance, you'd say, no, it's not sustainable. But we also know that for people who live in compact urban apartments in a city like Chicago or Manhattan or San Francisco, especially if they use public transportation rather than drive, they probably have a lower carbon footprint, the four of them, than a family of four that lives in Winnetka or Westchester in a 3,500 square foot house with an SUV and a station wagon, commute to the city, a, a drive to school, um, and these crazy you know, needs to heat and air condition the home. So what's the comparison? Um, I don't know. The, the, what's clear to me, despite how much damage there was in my hometown this past week, is that our, a sustainable future is an urban future and that we will live more densely in urban environments. Um, and I think living alone can be done viably there, uh, but I, re I don't really know, and I'd love to see some good research on that. I think this is gonna be the last question. I would be interested in hearing you speak about the realm of people living together without being married, uh, couples. Um, I've, there's been a lot of hand wringing over that over the years. I, I gather that the rise of of common law marriage has paralleled the rise of living alone. And I've read some research uh, saying that, oh my goodness, people who get married live longer, they're healthier, they're better off in many ways. And, but the report I read was financed by the Heritage Foundation and yeah. found out later that it was rather dubious. Yeah. So I'd be interested in your commenting on the relationship between living alone and couples living together without marriage. Right. Um, right. And Right, the, and how the, those two speak to each other. Yeah, the, I think the Heritage Foundation studies are done by the same people who were polling for Mitt Romney the last uh, <laughs> few weeks. Um, so, so, you know, so, um, I, I'm an empirical social scientist um, and nightclub singer on the side, and, <laughs> and um, I, the, I, I gotta tell you, like, I just can't answer your question, but I can say that, that you're right to note that the rise of living alone comes at the same time as, as the rise of cohabitation. The University of Chicago Press just published a really nice history of cohabitation, um, the name of which I can't remember, but you should read it if you're interested. Um, uh, what does this speak to? It, I mean, it speaks to the fact that, speaking of social experiments, I mean, we are trying to figure out the best way to live. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can organize our personal lives and our collective lives in a way that will give us the kind of intimacy and security that we all need as human beings um, without some of the pain that we have experienced in the traditional family. Um, and that's a tough one to figure out. I mean, the evolutionary psychologist will tell us there's a reason that the family has been the universal you know, uh, human um, structure for, for, for so long, and that we are really off the rails here, working in uncharted territory. Um, it's tough, this issue. It's, it's tough to be alive today and to not have one single way to live. You know, but if you believe in the sociology of madmen, 
for instance. Or if you read the diaries of women who were unhappily married and trapped in abusive relationships or relationships in which their spouse was not committed to them, or when they weren't committed to their spouse either. Um, it's not a one-way street here. If you read the amazing history of marriage by Stephanie Kuntz called Marriage, a History, you know, you, you see that um, the ideal family and the golden age wasn't necessarily so golden for everyone. That, that, you know, that, that actually that great social institution, the family, um, it was not a perfect institution. We lived through that. I'm a child of the divorce revolution. I mean, we, we know that experientially, but it's very hard to have an open and honest conversation about it. Um, I hope that tonight is the beginning of that conversation or marks a continuation of a, or deepening of that conversation. Um, and I know that I am utterly unable to offer the last word on the subject. Um, it's, this is one of the great problems of our time, and it would be uh, dishonest of me to, to come and tell you I have the answer. One of the great things about being a social scientist and being a scholar is you can enter into a, a, a world of questions and acknowledge that you don't know the answer. Um, you can, unlike a columnist for the Wall Street Journal or a political uh, candidate, you can say halfway through, oh my god, I was wrong. <laughs> um, and, 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 and end in a very different place than you started. So I might be standing where I started, but I'm ending in a different place um, <laughs> in some strange way. Thank you very much. <laughs>